Okay, here is class eight. And what we're going to cover today is we're going to do um, talk about contact stress. It's a, a, a stress you might not have heard of or been familiar with, but it'll be play an important role when we get into um, gears and uh, ball bearings in um, ME470. So I wanted to introduce it here and uh, just get you familiar. And that'll be the last topic that's covered in chapter three. So uh, we'll do a chapter three review and I'll do a number of different problems. These are, many of these are the same problems I think that are on the exam prep um, uh, uh, proper practice problems that I have. I think I have, I think there's two sets of problems and this is like one of the sets of problems. So these are, these are problems like you should, you should be able to do for, uh, the material that's covered up to this point. Um, some types of problems aren't on it. Um, because they're, uh, I, I decided they were good to know, but maybe not, um, it's too much material to miscellaneous material to cover on an exam. So, uh, uh just, uh, this is telegraphing, I guess this, th these are fair game type of questions. All right. So, uh, moving on to contact stress, and this is section 319 in the book. Uh, I often will ask this question here. Um, if you have these two bodies, right, they're both spheres and you can think of them maybe as marbles or uh, some type of uh, steel balls or what have you, and they're pressed together, I ask, what, um, what does the interface uh, between them look like? What, uh, uh, what, what, what can you imagine that's going to be? And the answer, it's going to be a single point, right, if these are perfect spheres. So... If you're pressing them against each other, what's the stress that's between these two balls? And well, what well, what kind of stress first? Well, it would definitely be compressive, right? And in terms of like the orientation we're used to, you would have to conclude that it's sort of like axial stress, but like in the direction of the forces, right? So uh, what's the area? So that would be F over A. What is the area between these two balls? And it's just a point, right? So it's going to get close to being a zero area. So that stress is that force. So they're showing W here. I don't know why they use W. But it would be W over something approaching zero. So the stress is becoming infinite. So what do we do? I mean, are they just going to explode because they're just, I mean, we didn't even know what the magnitude is. So uh, that's, uh, that's a little concerning. So what's going to actually happen is it's not going to be a point. If you press hard enough on them, there's going to be itty bitty spot that's going to flatten out a little bit. And so if you're looking at this, uh, if you're looking at this thing, I didn't turn my, uh, document camera on so let me let me go to the camera app and hopefully uh, this will um, recognize and probably get the rear camera first on this yeah that's the that's, that's what's behind my laptop right now it's exciting stuff um, okay so here's the document camera right here so um, here uh, zooming in because I it's very small on my notes I'll put a piece of paper in between here what you would have is you have a little circle, right? It, both of those things are going to flatten out a little bit, right? You can imagine that the it's going to have like a little flat spot. Uh, I didn't do a good job there, but then it's, and it's, it's a little flat spot, and then there's a curvature, right? So there's there's going to be like a little spot right in there if these are the the two spheres that they're touching each other, and it's going to be a it's going to be a circle. Um, now we go to the, here's another uh, commissary. What about two cylinders in contact with each other? Well, when they first touch, it'll be just a line, right? But if you press them a little harder and they deform, it'll actually be a little rectangle. And if you had like a sphere on a flat plate, that too would be a circle. 
And then I also, here's just another scenario right here. What if this is a sphere? Of course, we're only showing half of it. And it's in a, uh, like a, a, a little, um, ravine right here, right? That has its own radius uh, of curvature to it, right? What's going to be like a little ellipse is what's going to form right in there, right? And that's going to be the deformation of these pieces. And this this stress that's in there it has a couple of odd um, uh, uh, types of behavior. Um, we're not going to derive these things, but we want to know about them. But uh, one of the one of the things that's very clear is these are like in contact with each other. So we call them contact stress. And one of the people that did a lot of work on this is our our good friend Hertz. Right, and I always think of like you know the older brother that would like, hey, have you ever heard of had a Hertz donut? And then they hit you in the arm, and they're like, <laughs> Hertz donut. Let's see the kind of uh, older brother I was sorry to say anyway this guy Hertz not the Hertz donut kind Hertz uh, worked on this so this is often called Hertzian stress right um, and it has some um, some uh, interesting uh, uh, things that come out from it so um, and, and we talked about these because these are sort of like um, may maybe just the, the base kind of scenarios uh, that we would uh, uh, want want to explore, right? Um, later on, we'll see that uh, uh, that there uh, maybe there are scenarios that um, that do come up, but they're really just sort of like these this basis for uh, trying to uh, study the idea of these contact stresses. So they chose these as being the uh, the topics to to really kind of focus in on when. Um, trying to uh, derive the relationships. Okay, so uh, the first scenario, sphere and sphere contact right here is covered in the text. And we see that we have this def definition of something called A. And A is the distance, well, you could see if we zoom in on that right there, that right there, as we've done with most stress things, is a stress distribution, right? So you see that that's that that continues on and you know from our first uh, uh, I guess class two when we renewed um, those uh, ideas from mechanics and materials. What is stress? Stress is the distribution of internal loads. So we are always asking ourselves how are those internal loads distributed? And this in this case right here, it's got this distribution. Um, it looks like, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it looks a little bit parabolic, actually, a little bit to me. Like, and, and you can see, and it's compressive, it's uh, all the way. And uh, so I said, um, in, you know, in, in our answer to these two spheres touching each other, it's going to be uh, a little circle is going to be the uh, the area there that's uh, going to be formed uh, by this. So we ask ourselves, what's the radius of that circle? So you see that says is it's 2A. So A is really just the radius of the circle of the interface. And we're not going to uh, do the derivation of this, but the answer to what is that radius, it's the cube root of 3 times F, where F is the force that's being placed on there, divided by 8, and then there's a long thing right here on, in the numerator that goes 1 minus uh, nu 1 squared. That, okay, so that means that there's two different materials. We can, we're, we're, we're taking the, the case that maybe uh, the material um, of this one isn't the same as this, divided by E1 right and then plus 1 minus nu 2 squared divided by e2 right so we see that the material properties matter right and so not only uh, the elastic modulus which is kind of understandable right because these things are flattening out right so the stiffness of them matters and it's also expanding a little bit so it's not not just in one direction is it going to matter so we also have Poisson's ratio it also comes into uh, an effect of how, how large that radius is going to be and then also the curvature of these uh, spheres will matter so this on the denominator is 1 over d1 plus 1 over d2 
And I don't know why they chose to write it out this way. They probably could have done some algebra to make it out there. But that's equation 368, right? And so uh, that's, that's the radius of that circle, right? We, we haven't dealt with what the stresses are or anything. We're just trying to try to think how big is the radius of that circle? This is the answer. And they say, well, what's the maximum pressure? Well, of course, the pressure is going to vary um, within this uh this region of the circle but it's highest in the middle right in the center and then it gets less and less in that little circle you can think of there's like concentric rings but in the very middle is going to be the highest amount of pressure that's going to be placed on in between these so that's going to be three times f over two pi a squared right and you can see that this is f over a distance squared so that that it is a pressure term right it could be pounds per square inch newtons per square meter um but what have you now um now let's talk about stress so first off what are the um take a look at the axes we have this y and x so and we know that z is downwards Z is pointing downwards. We decided for whatever reason that we're going to see manipulate the thing. So X is our thumb, right? And Y is our index finger and our middle fingers point down. So, so we agree that's the right hand rule orthogonal um, coordinate axes. Um, but one thing we can say is that we, we know that it's going to be the distribution of stress. And you know, we might even draw these as little concentric circles of constant stress values, right? The outwards in the X and the Y direction they are going to be um, uh, uh, in the X and Y direction they're going to be uh, uh, equal to each other and they're going to be stresses that are kind of a consequence of these stresses like because all this really the forces are coming downwards and pressing these two spheres to each other so and that's in the Z direction so the uh, X and the Y, they're going outwards, right? And they're equal to each other. And they're also not going to be the, hot, the the most compressive stress. So they're not good. And there, let's say there's no shear involved. There's no shear that we can find. There's nothing causing a shearing action here. So in terms of these things end up being the principal stresses, the first and the second principal stresses, because we know those are going to be not necessarily are they going to be in tension, or zero, but they're not going to be as as compressive as they are in the z direction. We know that, right? And so we know they're equal to each other, and we know because there's no shears, they have to be the first and second principal stresses. So if we wanted to get the stress in the y direction, and by the way, we don't have to use any of these equations we're about to write down then why the hell are we writing them down? Because we want to think our way through them. So in the process of writing them down, we could start to have that thought. And so instead of just reading something, we'll write something. And for one thing, we note that in the y direction, which we know is equal to the x direction, and we know that's equal to one and two right there, right? So we know that we have P max, right? We said take, take, take that P max. And now is how is it distributed right there? Well, you know, someone somewhere said that it's going to have this distribution right here. Now, Z is a parameter, right? Z is something we're talking about the distribution of it. So it depends whether Z, you know, how deep into the either ball that we're going. Right? Are we going? Are we, we're gonna we're gonna look underneath the surface. So that's what Z is measuring. It's this axis right here, and we're just taking that ratio to A, where A is something we established from up here. So and, and then we'll take the inverse tangent of an angle that is one over Z over A. And that gets multiplied by one plus new, right? And I'm trying to squeeze all this stuff in there and maybe I should just like point it out in the book and we could just read it. But anyway, I started, so let's keep going. Um, divided, one divided by uh, two times one plus Z squared over A squared. Close that sum. All right, so 
lot of, lot of variables here, but let's not get into the weeds. Let's just take a look and notice something that Z over A, Z over A, and Z over A are all variables. So they, we could just like put Z over A together as, as a thing, right? Uh, that maybe, um, or even just take Z, right? Z is really the variable, uh, that's in here. Everything else is a constant that's already been determined, uh, for if we're given a force diameter material and what have you and radiant dia yeah, diameters, uh, we'd figure out what A is going to be. And that's really about the force and the stiffness and the interplay. So this, that's the radius of the, of the little circle it made. And then we have like, oh, here's the, here's the maximum, f uh, uh, pressure that's going to be within there. So now instead, well, let's use that pressure and say, well, how is that? Now it's going to be distributed in a way. So let's say if we have a certain distance, uh, away, uh, down in the, in, into the, uh, if we're starting to travel down into one of the spheres, here is going to be what the y direction, uh, stress is going to be. And, oh, and by the way, I think I forgot to point out, it is, uh, compressive right there, right? And so, um, it, it, this, this equation right here, and this is going to be both x and y, so we could even say x was equal to it right there. Um, we could plot that out, all right? So this right here is the distance from the contact surface in terms of A right here. You could think of this as being Z over A really right there, right? So uh, so Z, th this, is, this right here is 1.5, Z over A equals 1.5 right they just went ahead and kept the a in there so this is the distance below the surface right here is at the surface in any way you got f away from the contact surface so this right here is this equation up here plotted out so if you wanted to get what the, that actual value of that thing was you'd come down here and um, so you can see that this is, you know, this is just a distribution. They're describing the distribution. So if you know how deep, um, that you're going into there in terms of like, in, in is a, a function of A or a ratio of the, the A, the size, the radius of that little circle, you'd be able to find out what the stress is as a ratio of maximum pressure right here. So you can use this graph instead of using this equation. That makes our life a little tiny bit easier. Now, if we wanted the Z direction stress, that too is negative and it's going to be P max divided by one plus Z squared over A squared, right? That was supposed to be a Z. Look, it started to turn into a two somehow, right? So that was a little easier. Um, I think this is equation 370 right up here, and this is equation 371. But we don't really care about those equations because we can plot them. Once again, look at that's a function z over a, and there's p max. So now we can plot with as a z over a right here. We can plot z over a as a function right here of this thing, and so we could take that uh, a sigma z right there. And we could uh, uh, find this is the curve that's going to be formed by this equation. Once again, this right here shows us the ratio of the stress to P max, right? Um, and uh, so, so here is the curious thing, right? So, we, and once again, we don't have to use this equation. We have a graph of the trend of this distribution of internal loads, these stresses. But we do know that the absolute maximum, and, and by the way, this one right here is, um, this is the third principal stress because it's much larger and, and is always larger than the other two directions, right? So this is in the Z direction, this uh, which is coming straight down, up and down. Uh, this is going to be uh, uh, sigma three, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, sigma one and sigma two, right? So these are the other two principal stresses. There's three principal stresses. Here's the the third one, which is the most compressive, and here's the other two, which are equal to each other and they're less. So if we want to find the absolute maximum shear, remember that we take z uh, uh, sigma one minus sigma three and divide by two. And so we've actually plotted that out right there, right? 
what we see is there's a maximum location of where shear becomes maximum in this. And uh, if we go to this table, if we go to this figure in the book, we'll find that um, that maximum, the max of the max, is going to be equal to 0.3 times the maximum pressure, right? Which we calculated up here, right? So if we calculate this A and we calculate that max, max pressure, which required the A right there, we're able to find what that maximum stress is. It's just going to be 0.3, this is maximum shear, right? Now, when we're talking about shear, those are the individual little cubes, and this is the shear that's rubbing on them. But they're also the little cube in the next door neighbor shearing off of each other. And if the things happen to fail in that manner, because they can only have so much shear stress against them before they slip and they have a dislocation right there, right? And that dislocation is going to be a, per, a, a could be a, is going to be permanent damage that happens to the thing. This would be the stress that we would calculate. And interestingly enough, it's below the surface. That's a pretty interesting thing. And that actually will come up later on when we start to look at how things fail be due to contact stress. Um, they fail below the surface. And what we find is that we have little pits and uh, stuff, little, pit, little, little things popping out from the surface of something after it has worn down, after that contact stress has been onto the thing um, with, with a large, you know, large magnitudes of contact stress happening over fatigue wise right there. We see that they, they end up having little pits and stuff. Well, that some of the explanation of that is because the maximum experienced shear is actually below the surface so that can help to to create the dislocations which inevitably would make a pit uh, come out and so where is it located well you can find that like just looking really closely at this graph or we'll see in a second you could just look into the uh, caption that's next to this thing it's located at 0.48 a so these are really the only things we really need out of this graph. We don't have to use these equations at all. We have to use this equation and this equation because we're going to figure out the location with that A, but we're going to figure out the P max also with the A so that we can get what the maximum stress is going to be. Now let's take a look at where this is in the book. Um, so that's, uh, let's say, so this is like, you'll see that this is contact stress right in there. And here are, here are the formulas we just described. And here is this figure 337. And we take a look right there. There is where it says it's 0.3. And right here is where it says it's 0.48. Right, so this is what the maximum stress is going to be. It's at right here at that location, the maximum shear stress. And you'll note that it's like 0 0.3 is what they're saying that is. And they're saying 0 0.48 times A is this location. Now, one thing to note is that this curvature, uh, this, uh, this, uh, these graphs pick a Poisson's ratio of 0.3. So if you have a Poisson ratio of something else in your material, you're going to need to uh, do something else, right? You might have to actually cre recreate these curves. And you're going to say, well, oh boy, would I ever do that? And say, probably not. Do you think Dr. Deal would? Dr. Deal did. Yeah, yeah, I, I sure did. Um, so anyway, I, I made them in Excel because they're just plots of this thing right here. So you just pick out some points and make a string of the thing and plot the thing out. And you can make the curves yourself and, and, and see what the, what, what, what's going to happen. And if you change some of the parameters, not terribly difficult. So let's take a look at the other scenario other basic scenario, those two spheres in contact. Now instead, we're going to have two cylinders in contact and they got the nice shiny little aspect onto them as opposed to what's in my, what's in my um, uh, notes 
right? But um, they're similar but different, so you got to be careful here. One thing I, uh, I'd like to try to tell students and remind you that uh, a cautionary tale is that if you just flip through your book right here, you'll see that graph, and two pages later you'll see this graph, and you'll get them mistaken. You got to make sure that you're looking at the right thing, right? These are not the same. This is for the spheres. And this is for the cylinders. But let's go back to um, our basics here. And let's see what some of the compare and contrast. And by way of doing that, maybe we'll understand both of them better um, if we start to see two comparisons of two scenarios. So here's the cylinders. And as we mentioned earlier, their contact would be a line. But if you put some force onto it, eventually, probably pretty quickly maybe, it'll be a rectangle. A rectangle of how wide uh, 2B is going to be the width, right? So instead of A, we had A before. Now we have B. And our equation isn't the same. It's not cube rooted like it was over in the other one. It's just square rooted. And 2F, it was 3F before. And then divided by pi and now L where L is going to be the distance, the length of these cylinders right there. Uh, we have very similar stuff, though, over on the other side. We have 1 minus new 1 squared divided by E1, and then plus 1 uh, plus, is that, there's no plus, no, so it should be minus. That's what, I have like a little, uh, a little mark on my thing that's supposed to tell me that it's minus, but I look, didn't look at it closely. And divided by E2. And then in the denominator, we have the same 1 over D1 plus 1 over D2. So we have a lot of familiar things. We note that it's not a cube root. It's a square root. We note that we have this, uh, that, you know, we don't have any other one. Um, what do we have? Let's see. Let's uh, to, the compare and the contrast right there. We had uh, 3 eighths F. Now we have two two over two over pi l right there right but then we had some of the, a lot of the same stuff going on here because it's it too is dependent on the material properties because this is this is really the width of the rectangle that's being caused by having these two uh, cylinders uh, taking place on top of each other let me um, also while I'm here um, here's something that I, I like to use these in um, my mechanics uh, uh, in my uh, ME 470. So if you have me for that class, you'll see it again. Here's our here are gear teeth, and here are they. Here's how they're like interacting with each other. And of note here is that this is sort of a cylinder, and that's sort of a cylinder. So here's some of our motivation. Uh, for these and actually I think I jumped the gun because I have a slide that came next, but that's okay You, you can get you as you can see that some of the relevance uh, that's taking place in uh, uh, to, to something you might want actually care about right and the gears are more interesting than these cylinder things, right? Um, but we, we get the P max in a similar way. We have 2 times F divided by pi and then we have BL, right? So we had like it was a circle before, but now it's a rectangle. So we had three three halves really, and then F over pi A squared, right? So that this is right the area, right? Pi pi R squared. This is really the area of the thing, and so we were really having three halves F um, over A, and right here we really have um, two over pi really b times l because actually b l it should be 2 b l would be the area right 2 b l um because this is actually 2 b wide right here so we're only getting one half of the width when we get uh this b up above now for now it turns out that the stress in the x direction isn't the same as the y direction but why would it be right the x is going to be it varies this way the y is going this so they're actually different from each other and they're both um, they're both uh, going to be in compression. This is going to be two new Poisson's ratio p max, and then um, square root of one plus z squared over b squared minus z over b, absolute value. And this one, and once again, you don't really have to care about these equations. 
because all they're describing is this distribution and the distribution is uh, uh, a function of different properties but it's a repeatable thing right uh, and so we can actually make a curve of them and then pick the stuff off the curve or we could observe a trend in the curve and from those all right so that's equation 375 and 376 but what do we care it's actually going to be z i'll make you um sigma sigma y and sigma x right there and we uh, and we note that like x is along the length of the cylinder and y is going uh sideways uh from the thing and you note that there's a crossover point uh between these two interesting um, so, the, so neither one is sigma one and sigma two all the time. They they change roles as to which one's going to be the sigma one and the sigma two. And now in the z direction, which we see already from the graph, is always larger than the y and the x uh, right here. Is going to be minus p max over square root uh, one plus z squared over b squared and that's actually not all that much different uh from what we saw over here right so but there, there's a square root involved in something so the curvature of the thing looks a little bit different well okay so a lot of equations but really here's the trend that those equations are, are describing and so we have a z max remember uh i mean a, a tau max of uh sigma 3 minus sigma 1 divided by 2. Um, so you can see that that's plot in there. And you can see there's a little dippy-doo um, that's happening right in there. That's where that changeover point is, where this one was uh, probably sigma 2, uh, and this one was sigma 1, until they get to there, and then they flip roles as to which one is going to be uh, um, less uh, uh, than the other. Um, all right, and so if we take a look at the... Um, at the caption for uh, figure 339, uh, which is this one right here, they will tell us that the tau max, the tau max max, is going to be, once again, 0.3 p max. Interesting. That ends up being the same. Uh, that it, uh, And the z over b is going to be, 0.786, right? So you can kind of see that it's going to be like right up there times, uh, yeah, no, that's the Z over B, right? So that would be 0.786 B, right? So it's like somewhere like right in there, right? So you can see that once again, it's like 0.3 here and 0.786 there. It's not that complicated when you end up uh, seeing them, uh, uh, you know, what, what's, what's taking place here. These look very complicated. We didn't do a derivation of them. We're just going to take it on faith that like, okay, uh, someone has worked out for some way and then probably, it's, it's probably just uh, some, you know, calculus onto the thing and, you know, taking some of these properties and, and looking at, walking through them. I don't, I don't think we have, I don't, the book doesn't go through a derivation. I don't think it does. Um, but we want to know about contact stress. So these graphs are really what they're being told about. We kind of know that this is a, the distribution of stress, uh, was what we're going to have. But when we, everything was said and done, we really only care about those values, about what the, what the maximum stress is and then how deep into the cylinder. Remember, this is really what it's telling you is you can figure out what that, um, with that half width is going to be and that's what b is and then if you know that you could multiply it by that 0.786 and now you can get what the depth is going to be within the cylinder um so anyway uh there there was another diagram right there showing what essentially was saying with my gear finger puppets right that these things are cylinders that are rolling and they're rubbing right so there's actually friction taking place actually at the midpoint right here there's only rolling so there's like a little bit of friction happening here and a little bit of friction taking place but the these are contact stresses and you will see that there's actually contact wear is a way that gears will fail they'll have little, little t 
teeth, little pits and that kind of thing. There's micro pitting and there's spalls and uh, that type of thing. This is what they call them. There's lots of pits together. Um, but uh, let's see. I'm going to do examples after this in the next video. But there's one last thing. Because I have it, I was going to put up there. Um, let's see. So here is some uh, um, those figures larger. Here's the spheres, and there's the there's the equation out there for you, so I didn't have to write that whole thing out. And here's the equation out there for you, so I didn't have to write the whole thing out. But those are the kind of the principal things that we care about. And here's some of those um, failure modes uh, that you see, these pittings and spalls uh, that take place in gears and there's scuffing and in that type of thing and, and uh, um, the, these are stuff that is re real stuff that eventually these things fail but it's because of this contact stress uh, that's taking place so here is uh, my Excel and I plotted this out right here um, so, uh, that's the X um, for a sphere um, and the X and the y, X and a Y for a spear, but here's the X for a cylinder, and here's a Y for a cylinder, and you can see here's that crossover point, and here is the Z for a sphere, and here's the Z for a cylinder plotted on top of each other, right? So you can see these interactions um, taking place, and right there is the maximum shear for a sphere, and right there is the maximum shear for a cylinder, right? And here's an FEA showing um, with two cylinders touching each other and then we can see with this cross section we can kind of see where those and I believe this is Von Mises stress it might be uh, you can't really quite tell from uh, I, I should have uh, the, there's the title on top of the legend right there you can't quite tell what this one's for but I think I think this is like a a uh, Von Mises stress which is like a, a good overall stress overall magnitude it'll tell you but you could see that it there's there, the maximum according to this is away from the surface and then here's another one right here where we you know and I made a pretty fine mesh uh, within here but you could see that there's like uh, I don't know you know by the way th this could be a consequence the, the the thing in the middle of the the, the way that the, the gap elements which is what these are that in inside the interface right there that gap those gap elements uh, uh, they, they're like a switch. They're on and off switch. And as soon as there's enough defor deformation between the two pieces, and then now that the two uh, surfaces are in touching, because they start out not touching, but then as you start to calculate the thing and it deforms, it, it rechecks and says, oh, they're touching each other. Now the gap element closes and says, now you can't pass through each other. Um, it, it's a nonlinear uh, type of solution right there that can be kind of, uh, uh, can, it, it can have some problems. All right. So, so I'm not 100% uh, in agreement that that green area right there actually exists. But it's, I'm trying to give you a sense of what this stress distribution, the distribution, that's really what we're talking about, uh, what that actually looks like. And here's one from somebody else's, um, this is Von Mises stress. You can see there, that stress that's right there. This stress right here is due to the bending, if you will, of the tooth. Right, so there's force being put of one a one gear tooth onto another. So there's bending stress that occurs right here and right here. One's going to be tension, one's going to be compression. But in von Mises, it's always a positive value. And right here is the uh, uh, contact stress that's underneath the surface. So you can see that it's a it, the, the, this is actually just the amount of red, if that's what we're going to use as maybe our gut feel for what's taking place there, is a pretty significant amount especially uh, compared to the amount of red that we're seeing there due to bending. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do a video that's going to be um, problem 3136. So that's our big, long introduction to contact stress. And maybe in class I'm going to go a lot faster, but I'll have this video that maybe I could direct you to if maybe I go a little too fast uh, for the introduction here. Uh, maybe I belabored it a little longer with the 38 minute video, but hopefully this will be helpful to you uh, in trying to uh, digest this important topic.